Hello and welcome to Hank and Jay to answer your fish questions, where the questions are fishy, but the answers are fact-checked by a real marine biologist. And this is that marine biologist. It's Jada Elcock, who has, for the last four months, been our SciShow resident. And you're our first one. It's been super fun, so thank you. <laughs> Jada's been writing episodes and hosting episodes that are going to start coming out next week. Jada is a shark scientist who's finishing up a PhD program with MIT. It's a joint program with MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And hello! Hello! Thanks for doing this. It seems like it's been really fun. Oh, it's been a blast and a half. I'm so excited to be here. I just, there's so many cool people doing good stuff on the internet yeah. in science communication. And Absolutely. So we just wanted to reach out and create a little bit more community. But importantly, today, the thing we actually want to do is answer your fish questions. Yes. And we have a lot of fish questions. We reached out, people sent them to us. Yes. Hundreds. Lots of fish questions. <laughs> Way more than we're going to get to right now. Yes. And our first question is from Deef Dragon, who asks, what is a fish? Not a particularly easy question to answer. You would think that it would be the easiest question to answer, and it simply is not. My favorite fact is that I'm a fish. Yeah, okay, so there's like two definitions of what a fish is. There's like the colloquial definition of what you think a fish is. Yeah, it's a thing that looks like a fish. Yeah. Swims it's... around in the water, breathes oxygen, but in the water. Yes, specifically does not have limbs, like it has fins, because, you know, some salamanders will... You know, is a vertebrate, has a spinal cord. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All of these things. Skeleton, either bony or cartilaginous, yeah. all of these things. But then you have your like genetic, phylogenetic evolution type of definition. Yeah. And that one's a lot more complicated. That's basically just saying everything that is a vertebrate is a fish. Yeah. So like so like what's the common ancestor of all fish is also the common ancestor of all vertebrates. Yes. The first vertebrate was a fish. So given that, everything that comes after fish are also fish. Am I more closely related to like a bass than a shark? Yes. Okay. You have, you share- Is a bass ancestor? more closely related to me than a shark? I believe so. <laughs> because you share a common ancestor yeah. more closely with bony fish yeah, bony than- fish. than than the cartilaginous fish. Yeah. But then there are the animals that have fish in the name, like jellyfish, starfish, not fish. Those are invertebrates, and so things get very complicated. And then there are animals with horse in the name that are not horse. Right. That are fish. Seahorse and leafy sea dragon, but that- oh, Also not a dragon. Not a dragon, but a fish. And also a super cool animal, incredibly underrated, and everyone should know more about that. But is a seahorse. Yes. Well- But not a horse. Correct. Silverfish. Bug. Oh my god, I hate that one. I had a silverfish on my head once in elementary school, and I took a very long time to live that down. I live in an old building, and we have silverfish mm. everywhere. You're coming to my office tomorrow, and you will see that like pill bugs come there to die. Well, pill bugs are I cute. <laughs> silverfish are creepy, <laughs> yeah. in my humble opinion. Yeah, I don't know. They move in such a fluid, fast way. Just little I isopods There's, that oh live on god. land. Deep sea isopods are so cool. Sorry, but we're I'm not going to talk about that. No, but I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Important fish question. Lason Land asks, how do fish get oxygen out of the water? Gills. Um, much more complicated than that. Diffusion. Like it's yeah, a concentration yeah, yeah. gradient thing. Yes. So their gills have are like super vascularized. They have tons of blood flow. Lots and, of surface area, just exactly. like our lungs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then you have, when the water passes over that, the oxygen then di diffuses from the water into the bloodstream because that's where it is less concentrated. A lower concentration. So Correct. they're putting pushing the blood to the gills that has already been spent. So it's already used up the oxygen and turned it into carbon dioxide. That mm -hmm. stuff's going to the gills. The carbon dioxide is then higher concentration in the blood, it diffuses out. Yep. And the oxygen is lower concentration, it diffuses in. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. This is a strange thing I did not understand for a long time. Shouldn't they just be able to breathe air then? If they can get it out of the water, which is a lower concentration of oxygen than the air, why can't they get it out of the air? Right. I think it's because the surface needs to be wet. Otherwise, oh, it doesn't it function necessarily the same. Right. Because it's not designed to be out in the air. Yeah, exactly. And then there's also like the surface area of the fish's gills can also potentially tell you a little bit about their lifestyle because... If they have a ton of surface area, they might live in a low oxygen environment so that they have all of that surface area to try and collect as much oxygen from that low oxygen environment as possible. So they have big fat gills. Yeah. Where's low oxygen in the ocean? So some deep cold? sea places, uh, well, cold water has more, more oxygen yeah. typically just because it dissolves better. So tropics have pretty low oxygen, um, which is why you also have some like air breathing fish like betta fish mm. in 
uh, mm. the tropics, but then also some areas of the ocean in like deeper waters, you have oxygen minimum zones. It's just an area with really limited oxygen. And so if you're gonna be a fish that exists in there or near it, you need to have, have enough big gills. have enough gills to, or have enough surface area in your gills to take advantage of gotcha. the oxygen that's there. I guess I knew that colder water holds more gas because of how soda works. But it feels like it shouldn't to me. Yeah, but if you think about it, like if you have a hot soda, that that it's not gonna be a bubbly anymore. That's really fair. Gavin XP asks, are there fish that make noises? There's gotta be. There are, and it's so much more common than you think it is. Oh. So they use- uh, Are there sharks that make noises? They seem very quiet. I don't think that there's evidence that there's sharks okay. that make noises. Hmm. Um, I think maybe there's I evidence- I love a scientist who's like, I don't think that there's evidence that. Well, I don't wanna Leaving say space no. space for the future. Like yeah. we don't know everything yet. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so some fish will rub together like bony parts of their skeleton. Some oh. of them will like vibrate their air-filled swim bladder and make these like drumming or thumping yeah, or like vibrating drum sounds. fish are called drum fish for that reason? I actually did not know that there was a drum fish. Drum fish. I'm noises. so fascinated. Oh, they're goofy. She likes every fish, you guys. I do. <laughs> they're all really cool. <laughs> Even the ugly ones. Uh -huh. They're funny. Yeah. But yeah, so they can make sounds for a lot of different reasons, uh, a lot of different purposes. You can have for like communication between each other, for competition, for mating purposes and courting. And I actually have a friend, Ella Kim, is doing research on how fish make these chorus sounds, like fish chorus. singing, oh. and basically how that's they're trying to better understand it and figure out how that's being affected by like marine heat waves. It's weird because we think about the marine mammals as being very vocal, but like the fish, you say they make a lot of noises, they're pretty quiet. And also they're just like rubbing body parts together. They didn't like evolve vocal cords, I, but yeah. I guess the vocal cords evolved on land and then they took them into the water. And it's cool because then we have technology. We've got the hydrophones, these like underwater microphones that yeah. help us listen to those like chor chorus sounds from mm -hmm. the fish and then help us understand them better. It's and very interesting. Yeah. I love when you put your head under the water in an area that's like very alive, like a mm -hmm. coral reef, and it's just like, oh. You can hear like the like snapping shrimp. happening down there. The snapping yeah, shrimp just like making It's a lot of clicking. shrimp noise. It's yeah. so many shrimp yeah. noises. <laughs> Voitrezes asks, honestly, I'd love to know why coral reefs are so important. We all know the damage done to the ecosystem is bad, but why are fish so reliant on coral and die when it is absent? There are plenty of other sources of nutrients, I would think. This is a great question. It is. You always hear that coral reefs are like the most diverse place on earth. Yes. But what, like what's so good about them? So people- I, That sounded inauthentic. I am actually curious. Yeah, no, I mean, people describe them as like the rainforests of the yeah. ocean. And it's because of how diverse they are are, how much diversity they hold. I think there's some statistic like a quarter of all marine species yeah. rely on coral reefs in some aspect or another. They provide food and shelter for a ton of different animals, especially, you know, you've got like your sharks coming in and then you've got your smaller fish that are like, oh, well now I have a place to hide and the shark can't get to me. Yeah. Um, like the fact that like top level, there's so many like top level uh, predators in a, in a coral reef just shows that there has to be a ton of food. Yeah, there's so much there. You've got so many different animals filling so many different niches right. and that creates so much food for your top predators and then even your mid-level predators, there's so much other stuff to eat for them as well. Is it like a surface area thing? Is there just like more, like just like the gills? So there's just like all of this crenellation to it, all that. That's probably part of it with all these like nooks and crannies yeah. to hide in, not just for fish, but for like invertebrates and everything too. Yeah. But because there's so much diversity in corals as well, you have so much diversity in the fish that use them. Mm -hmm. So you've got like your parrot fish that are scraping algae off of corals and like right. eating the corals themselves. You have other animals that are also scraping algae off corals. You have algae for the fish to eat and all of these things kind of go together and you've got this like very yeah. intricate relationship that can be disturbed quite easily. Overfishing right. and you have less fish that will affect the corals, but then you have coral bleaching that kills the corals and then the fish have nothing to like hide with and eat, so. And also that there's no like base level production. Yeah. Growth. And the other thing is this is like, they tend to be warmer areas mm -hmm. like with less depth, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like the sunlight is actually reaching. Exactly, so you've got tons of photosynthesis happening, yeah. which photosynthesis is dope. I'm not a chemist, but you know. It's dope. It is dope. I mean, I, I feel like a similar vibe with kelp forests mm -hmm. where there's just like a lot of opportunity yeah. for there to be like things living on things, living on things, living on things. Yeah, it feels like Horton hears a who, where there's just like, right. it's everything's living on a speck. Mm -hmm. I don't like know. a whole ecosystem on a leaf yeah. vibes. Yeah. Very cool. Painter asks, what fish lives the longest and how is it able to live that long? 
Is it a shark? Yes, it is a shark. it's a shark. It's a Greenland shark. It's the longest living vertebrate species that we know of. Right, not just fish, but all vertebrate. of Vertebrate, yes. Yeah. The oldest one is estimated to be somewhere between 300 to 500 what? years old, which makes no sense. That's a very long range, too. I heard somewhere someone said that like this one individual shark would have been alive when Alexander Hamilton was alive and also yeah. would have been alive to see the musical about his life written. <laughs> and I'm like, that's so cool. That's so cool. <laughs> if if only the shark cares. Yeah, he doesn't know? care at all. But <laughs> I care that he got to live through both of those. Yeah. Uh, My like vibes around why Greenland shark live so long is that they just live slow. Yes. Like their metabolism is slow. Their growth is slow. Mm -hmm. They grow around like a centimeter a year, which is slower than Mount Everest grows. <laughs> so <laughs> very slow shark. They just... Yeah. Slow and steady wins the race and yeah, outlives what everyone. They, what do they do? Did they just sort of just like glide through the ocean? What, filter feeding? No, they predators? are scavengers and predators. Oh, okay. So they'll eat dead things that they find just hanging around, but they also sneak up on sleeping seals. Huh. Seals will see, sleep in the water to avoid getting eaten by polar bears, uh -huh. but then they're asleep and they don't notice this incredibly slow other predator coming up from behind and then they get eaten. But then they've, they've also eaten like they found like polar bears and like reindeers in their stomachs. So it's like what? anything that's just like falls dying. In. Yeah, falls in and dies. And they're just like, that looks delicious. I'll eat Great. that. Just a weird animal. How would we possibly know how long, how old a shark is they if it's used, hundreds of years old? Yeah, they used carbon dating on proteins found in their eyeballs. Oh, so the so shark has like, to be dead. Right, 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 right. And also it has to be something that has been there the whole time. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a protein that I guess is... Formed in utero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so these proteins are um, in their eyes, and once they're extracted, we're able to kind of right. carbon date them. And yeah, so there's actually like a ages. piece of the shark that's theoretically been there the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I love dating. Is so weird. It's not Tinder. I'm. <laughs> I've been married forever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the the fact that we get to know when stuff happened. Yeah. It's very hard. Mm -hmm. And we have amazing techniques now yes. that work very well. Yep. Chicken Y Tire asks, I'd like to learn more about bioluminescence in fish and if any species have been discovered to biofluoresce, like scorpions and flying squirrels and platypus do. Does the glow only serve as a purpose to attract prey or are there other reasons for it? There are certainly, there must be. Yes. So there's bio luminescent fish, including sharks. What? And there are also biofluorescent sharks. So bioluminescent sharks, um, you've got like your lantern sharks and they glow blue on their belly. What? They like live in the deep sea. They're producing their own light. And that's either to attract prey towards them so that they can take a chunk out of it or eat something. And then there's also counter shading, basically to, if you look at them from below, then you can see that they, they kind like of this, blend they, in they with them. They look the, like up. Yeah, they look like up. And then when you look at them from the top, they look like down. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> That's why you see this color pattern in all kinds of marine Yeah, animals. yeah, yeah. You yeah. see the same thing with uh, white sharks with like white on the belly yeah, orcas. and dark on the top. Exactly. Yeah. I cannot believe there's a bioluminescent shark and I there's didn't know that. several, actually. There's tons there's of- out there down there glowing? There's a group of sharks called lantern sharks and they all glow. Why don't I get to glow. <laughs> <laughs> you do glow in your own. Thanks, in infrared. Oh, that's different. Sorry. Can't help you there. Um, <laughs> but then biofluorescent sharks, you've got uh, your swell sharks and your chain cat sharks, where like, obviously we can't see that glow, yeah. but they can see it from each other. Uh -huh. And it's believed that maybe it helps them identify members of the same species and helps with communication in some way. Yeah. And it's adorable to see pictures of these little cat sharks glowing bright green. It's so cute. So biofluorescence then is when... Uh, light hits and then it fluoresces a different color. Yeah. So it is absorbed and then refluoresces. Yes, yeah. Whereas luminescence is just creating light from nothing. Correct. Wild. My favorite reason that uh, this isn't actually a fish, but it's a fish related fact okay. for bioluminescence is that copepods, like some of these like tiny little crustaceans, will bioluminesce specifically so that when a fish eats them, they then glow. And then the fish is like, oh no, I'm glowing and I'm gonna get eaten by another fish, and so it spits out the copepod. <laughs> I didn't know that! Yeah. That's so cool! Yeah, because they're like, like they're so small that they're see-through. And they're like, I can't be glowing in the water! Wow, that's yeah. really smart. That's really smart. What a really cool idea. And it looks like when they spit it out, it looks like they're like shooting a little fireball. I need a video so immediately. Yeah, there, there's I'm one, I don't know if we one. have rights to it, but it's very good. I'm gonna find one. That yeah. is so cool! Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Facts. Jada, thank you for making a SciShow with us and thank you for being our first ever SciShow resident. Oh my gosh, of course. Thank you so much for having me. You know so many things 
And you're so good at telling people about them. Thank you. And we, you can find her at Jada Elcock, Sophistication. Sophistication on TikTok and Twitter and Sophistication underscore on Instagram. And you can see Jada here every week for the next 10 weeks hosting SciShows that she wrote with the SciShow team. <laughs> <laughs>